Hi YouTubers, on a recent visit by the Pope to Britain we uh, found that he beautified, which whatever that is, but it was a, an honour bestowed upon Cardinal Newman, who was a basically a Church of England priest who became a Catholic and went on to become a Cardinal. I would think that atheists deserve their own beautification process and I propose Charles Bradlaugh. Okay, here we are in the heart of Northampton. This is Arrington Street, or Arrington Square in fact, this part. It's now a sort of major traffic roundabout. As you see, there's a, uh, the statue there of Charles Bradlaugh. Now back in the later, latter parts of the 19th century, this area was the most ungodly in the whole of Britain. In his time, Charles Bradlaugh was as famous as Richard Dawkins is today. So why is it that we've forgotten Charles Bradlaugh? Most people you ask, even in Northampton, don't actually know who he is. They have no idea what he did. And if you say, well, it's that statue in Abington Street, they go, oh yeah, what's that all about? Basically, I'm going to tell his tale. He was born on the 26th of September 1833 in the east end of London, Hoxton. He became an office boy in a solicitor's office where his father worked as a clerk. He was influenced by the ideas of Richard Carlyle. Now Richard Carlyle, he was a parliamentary reformist and republican. He lived in an age where only three men in a hundred had a vote, and no women at all obviously had a vote at that time. Carlyle published works including the famous Thomas Paine's Age of Reason. Now that was critical of the church and articles criticising the government, uh, which in those times was illegal. He was duly sentenced to three years in prison for blasphemy and seditious libel. Meanwhile, Bradlaugh had fallen out with his family over sort of religious differences. Yeah, apparently he also fell out with his local priest. He joined the Dragoon Guards and was posted to Dublin in Ireland. He disliked the army and, following an inheritance from an aunt, managed to buy his way out and joined the uh, law office, or a law office at least. By now he was a committed Republican. And he was also a free thinker and an atheist. In 1860 he co-established the radical journal The National Reformer. In 1866 he helped establish the National Secular Society, uh, an organisation that of course was opposed to Christian dogma and supporting atheism. Secular in those days was very much the same usage as the Pope gave recently. It really meant atheism. However, um, in due course, Bradlaugh met Annie Besson and the two became close friends. Annie Besson, she was a, a vicar's wife who questioned her religious beliefs and was ordered to leave by her husband when she refused to take communion. She rejected Christianity and joined the Secular Society, being employed then by Bradlaugh um, who wrote, and wrote many articles for the National Reformer. Basically, they're on the subject of marriage and women's rights and of course women's suffrage. In 1877 they decided to publish The Fruits of Philosophy by Charles Knowlton. It was a book that advocated birth control. Besson and Bradlaugh were charged with publishing material that was likely to deprave or corrupt those whose minds are open to immoral influences. Which is quite a charge really isn't it? In the court they argued that we think it more moral to prevent conception of children than after they are born to murder them for want of food, air and clothing. However, Besson and Bradlaugh were both found guilty of publishing an obscene libel and they were sentenced to six months in prison. However, at a court of appeal their sentence was quashed. This was a famous trial that split the free thought movement but largely helped to reduce the size of Victorian families.
Authorities attempted to obstruct the activities of Bradlaugh and other free thinkers. Pamphlets on religion were seized by the post office and on several occasions they were excluded from using public buildings for their meetings. In 1882, the staff journal of the Free Thinker were prosecuted for blasphemy and two of them were found guilty and sent to prison. However, it was to be Bradlaugh's political career that was to cause the greatest impact. In 1880, after three unsuccessful attempts earlier, Bradlaugh was elected to Parliament for Northampton. Now before we get to this actual piece, I want to say something about Northampton at that time. During the 17th century, most of Northampton was completely destroyed in a great fire in the same way that London had been destroyed. During the 18th century, it was slowly rebuilt with widened streets and an air of beauty. Daniel Defoe described it as the most beautiful town in Britain. It was a market town grown mainly on its cattle its uh, beef stock and of course this provided it with a large source of leather. Northampton became famous for sh boots and shoes and it was really a small cottage industry of multitude of small shops. During the Napoleonic Wars it won numerous contracts in fact for the army and nearly everybody eventually in Britain would have worn a pair of boots or shoes made in Northampton. It became the sole centre for the industry. Now during the 19th century with the great industrial revolution the demand for shoes becoming that much greater and factories were needed to produce them in vast quantities. Factories shot up but they needed workers and in order to help their workers at the time, they built a multitude of small box-like terraced housing right amongst the industrial heartland, the factories themselves. In fact, if you look at these streets, you'll see uh, how the factories and the houses were together. In those days, of course, there were no cars. Getting to work was important. They needed large workforce. And in some ways this, this was a good thing, but when you put a lot of people together in these masses of terraced houses with no other life except for really working factory and then straight back to home a few yards away, it spread dissidents, it spread uh, unease amongst the workers and of course conditions became deplorable in many cases. Bradlaugh realised this. Bradlaugh seized upon backing these people. He wanted rights for these people. He could see uh, the welfare needed taken care of. And being such a great orator, it wasn't so much his atheism that got him popular. It was the fact that he really cared for the people. And his ideas were probably followed on. He lived in a time where it was the people that now were going to decide who went to Parliament. Before that, the aristocracy were the only people who voted for themselves most of the time. He advocated a sort of social democracy, something which the people needed. The boot and shoe union was forming. People had representation. He was a liberal. He joined the Liberal Party. and. He represented the Liberals. Now Liberals in those days should not be confused with Liberals in these days. They were Social Democrats indeed, but not Socialists. But they were the nearest thing that the people had to their own representation. Now being an atheist had its problems. In Parliament you could not sit as an atheist. Yet during a parliamentary campaign on one evening in 1874 during an electoral campaign. When the results were read out <clears throat> and Bradlaugh himself was ostracised for being an atheist, it started a riot in the town centre. Several thousand of Bradlaugh supporters 
tore up the cobblestones of the market square and stoned the windows. The riot was such that the, the, police, the police of the time were unable to cope and the militia were called only when bayonets were fixed uh, and rifles, rifles at the ready the crowd actually dispersed. Now Brad Lloyd tried several times to be elected to represent Northampton in Parliament. He was eventually elected in 1880 but as he was not a Christian he asked for permission to affirm rather than take the oath of office. The Speaker of the House of Commons refused his request and Bradlaw was expelled from Parliament. William Gladstone, the Prime Minister at the time, supported Bradlaw's right to affirm. But he'd upset a lot of people, his views on Christianity, monarchy and birth control, etc. And when, when the issues were put before Parliament, MPs voted to support the Speaker's decision to expel him. Bradlaw now mount, mounted a national campaign in favour of atheists being allowed to sit in the House of Commons. He gained some support in some of the non-conformists, but was strongly opposed by the Conservative Party and leaders of the Anglican and, Cla and Catholic clergy. When Bradlaugh attempted to take his seat in Parliament in June 1880, he was arrested by the Sergeant at Arms and briefly imprisoned in the clock tower of the House of Commons. Benjamin Disraeli, the leader of the Conservative Party, warned that Bradlaugh would become a martyr and it was decided to release him. On April the 26th, 1881, Charles Bradlaugh was once again refused permission to affirm. The Prime Minister William Gladstone had promised to bring in legislation in due course, but this would take time. Bradlaugh was unwilling to wait, and when he attempted to take his seat once again on the 2nd of August, he was once again forcibly removed from the House of Commons. Bradlaugh and his supporters organised a national petition, and on the 7th of February 1882, he presented a list of nearly a quarter of a million signatures calling for him to be allowed to take his seat. However, when he tried to take the parliamentary oath, he was once again removed from Parliament. Gladstone's affirmation bill was discussed in Parliament in the spring of 1883. The Archbishop of Canterbury and Cardinal, Cardinal Manning, head of the Catholic Church, argued against the rights of the atheists to be MPs. And when the vote was taken in May 1883, the affirmation bill was defeated. In 1884, Bradlaugh once again was elected to represent Northampton. He took his seat and voted three times before being excluded. He was later fined £1,500 for voting illegally. Bradlaugh decided to try again and take the oath on the 13th of January 1886. The new speaker, Sir Arthur Wesley Peel, did not object, arguing that he, that he had authority to interfere with oath-taking. Bradlaugh now had the right to speak and the vote, to, and the vote in the House of Commons after six years of, of being elected an MP. Bradlaugh had won. Never again would atheists be given second citizen status. He continued in Parliament until he eventually died in 1891. His funeral was attended by several thousand, including the great leader of India that was known as Gandhi. Gandhi at the time was just a student studying law. So why did he go to his funeral? Bradlaugh supported Irish Home Rule. He also supported Home Rule in South Africa, Afghanistan, Sudan and, and Egypt, and of course India. He was bitterly opposed to the foreign occupation of these countries and involvement by the military. Outside of Parliament, his influence waned a little on the rise of socialism, not social democracy. He opposed socialism as, a vague, in de as vague in detail, but likely to lead to violent revolution, tyranny, censorship, lack of enterprise and economic stagnation. Criticisms later vindicated by the experience, of course, of the Eastern Europe and Soviet bloc, Soviet Union. Instead, he exulted, perhaps optimistically, in education, reform, cooperative retail and uh, building friendly and insurance-based societies. However, if Bradlaugh was alive today, he would see that religion had not gone away and still remains as an influence in Northampton. Yet I want to present Charles Bradlaugh for an atheist beautification. He used the word secular as a sort of political arm of the atheist movement. To him, secular brought up issues such as home rules, contraception and reform. I'm raising my glass to Charles Bradlaugh.